Hey, Cedar Creek, I wanna welcome all of our campuses. If you're tuning in online or later on in the week, I'm so glad that you've joined us. Uh, today, we're gonna to continue the conversation about how can we live confidently out of place? There's all sorts of different times, spaces in our lives where we feel like we're the one thing that's not quite like the others. For some of us, we experience that more than others. But as Jesus followers, it's like, how do we navigate those places where we, we don't feel like we belong? Do we just try to fit in with culture? Do we just kind of remove ourselves from culture? And what we've seen in this ancient letter written to a group of Christians is that God invites us to understand where we belong so that we can live confidently, not arrogantly, not rudely, but confidently out of place at whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever environment. So today, to keep that conversation going, I invited a good friend of Cedar Creek and of mine, Calvin Sweeney. He's actually a doctor, Dr. Calvin Sweeney, to come and speak to us. And he's gonna give us that practical next step on what does it look like to live confidently out of place when we remember ultimately where we belong. So we please give a warm Cedar Creek welcome to Calvin Sweeney. Wow, thank you for such a warm welcome here today. Um, I just wanna first say I am so excited to be here at Cedar Creek. Uh, and I am literally more excited that you are here today um, I like to say something uh, when I speak, wherever I speak, I believe this, that you are not here today by accident, incident, or circumstance. I believe that you are here today because your steps have been ordered by God. I believe God has something special for you to grab today. So I want you to put on your listening ears, buckle up your seatbelt, put your arms inside for the ride, and be prepared to receive whatever it is that God has for us today. And I am excited about this 4th of July week. I celebrated the 4th in a special way with my family and my friends. And, and we just hung out at one of my cousin's houses. And we had an opportunity to uh, engage in playing cards and listening to music. As a matter of fact, they had uh, a live band playing. But how many know that the 4th of July was a really, really hot day? and uh, you know, just oozing sweat that day. And so they had this fabulous band out in the backyard and most of the people were inside enjoying the cool air. And this beautiful lady with a beautiful voice was out there singing, dripping with sweat. And she even had a fan while she was singing. And we were with her, but we were with her inside the house with the AC. Hello, somebody. <laughs> How many of you enjoy celebrating 4th of July this week? Yeah, it's cool to hang out with family and friends. And we went down to the river uh, in Toledo and watched the fireworks down there by the river. And, you know, it, it's cool when you think about what we're actually celebrating uh, during the 4th of July. We're, we're celebrating this ideal, this idea, and this actual uh, freedom that we experience and that we continue to experience in this great nation that we have an opportunity to, to be a part of. And, and we also are celebrating those ideals from our Constitution, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of, of happiness. And you know, as I was thinking about that this week, I just got stuck on the happiness part. And I started thinking about what is it that makes people happy? What do people think will make them happy? And so I did, you know, a Google search. You know, that's official, right? That's scholarly. And, uh, and there's some things that showed up there. And you know, when I was a kid, after the 11 o'clock news, I would stay up to watch the late night shows. And my, one of my favorite shows was the David Letterman. And you know, David Letterman used to have the top 10. And I'd like to stay up and hear that. And, and today we're not gonna do a top 10, but I am gonna do a top five things that people think will make them happy. And I'm gonna ask for just a little crowd participation. I just want you all around all the campuses to shout out, what do you think the number one thing is that makes people happy? Money, Money. I've heard that over. Well, let's see. A little drum roll, if you want to mind helping me. Come on, hit your legs a little bit. Ah. Number five is fame. I mean, people think if they become famous and everybody knows who they are, like, you know, on Cheers, everyone knows who you are, and that'll make them happy. Number four is money. 
You know, people think money will make them happy. You know, everyone always says that money won't make you happy, but let's be honest, how many of you would like to find out if all the money you could wish for would make you happy or not? <laughs> and then third, the third thing that makes us happy, people think, is beauty. People think if they like what they see in the mirror, if they were 10 pounds lighter, nose was a little shorter, hips were, you know, if they just had a perfect image, they think they'd be happy. And then the second thing that people think would make them happy is to have an extraordinary gift or skill set. You know, kind of like a LeBron James, like a freak of nature, a kind of skill set like that. Now, that's been a sore topic of, uh, uh, for a lot of people in Ohio the last few days. You know, because he's leaving Cleveland. Did you know that? And he's going to L.A. There must be a lot of Cavaliers fans in here because people are like, oh, this is not a good move on preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and the number one thing that people think will make them happy is power. And I'm guessing if you had all the power, you could have all the other stuff, right? <laughs> kind of comes with the territory. But you know what's not on this top five list? Is a relationship with God. And I believe most Christians, and we're predominantly a Christian nation, I believe most Christians would think that a relationship with God would make them happy. I even think that non-Christians would think that, yeah, if someone had a relationship with God, they should be happy. But here's the thing. A relationship with God is not going to make us happy. Now, I know that doesn't sound right at first, but hear me out. Because happiness is based upon happenings. And we can't control the things that happen to us. Sometimes good things happen to us and we feel happy. But then sometimes bad things happen to us and we don't feel happy. We feel unhappy about it. And so what God wants us to have is not happiness. God gives us joy, unspeakable. The Bible says the joy that he gives no one can take away. So when I have the kind of joy that God gives people, that joy sustains me when I'm having good things happening to me, and it gets me through the times when I have bad things happening to me. He gives us joy. Now, the reality is that God's greatest desire for us is not that we would be happy. God's greatest desire for us is that we would be holy. Instead of life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness, in God's kingdom, right, in Christendom, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. God wants us to be holy. But our churches are becoming more like the world because the world is becoming increasingly more hedonistic. By that I mean desiring the pleasures and the comforts of this life indulging in the pleasures and the comforts ad nauseum. And yet, it's spilling over into the church. And the church is beginning to be a church that embraces a gospel of happiness, a theology of happiness, where we think that if you come to God, you're just going to be happy. He's going to make you happy. And because people want to be happy, then preachers start preaching about that if you come to God, not that he'll give you everything you need, but that he'll give you everything that you want. And we got to be careful when we start to embrace a gospel of happiness. If we think that God wants us to be happy, then we think any time that we experience discomfort, delay, risk, that that must not be God's will for our life. God wants us to be happy. And that's dangerous because we start to rationalize. We start to justify that if something doesn't make me happy, then God doesn't want me dealing with it. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of areas and examples where that could become really dangerous. Let's say someone has been married for about 25 years, and, and they're thinking, you know, I put 25 years in. You know, like marriage is a job, like they're checking their seniority, right? I put 25 years in, and I'm not happy. And it's God's will for me to be happy. Therefore, it must be God's will for me to leave and walk out 
after 25 years of marriage. Walking out the door on the person who you stood before God, family, and friends and entered into a holy covenant with, all of a sudden, yeah, doesn't make me happy. Or we begin to justify, you know what? What will make me happy is the next big ticket item, the next piece of new technology, the the newest car, the, the better home. And all of a sudden, I begin to think, yeah, you know what? God wants me to be happy, so God probably wants me to go in, wouldn't mind if I go into a lot of debt to be happy. We don't steward our money because God wants us to be happy, and we start to use God to justify that. And if we're not careful, we begin to make false gods out of comfort and pleasure. And no longer is the case that we're serving God, but God is serving us. And we make God to be now a genie in a bottle. And we just rub the bottle and poof, God shows up and he just does everything we want. But it's not God's desire for us to be happy. That's not his primary concern for us. His primary concern for us is that we be holy. But what does that mean to be holy? We hear that word around church circles a lot. Does it mean to be better? Does it mean to be like a Pharisee? I mean, if you went into a Starbucks, you probably have as many people as you ask, you'll have that many different images popping into people's heads of what it means to be holy. I think if we look at what the original definition is for holy, we'll get an idea of what it is that God is trying to say to us. So in the Greek, the Greek word for holy it's hagios, not hagen I saw some of you. He said, did he say hagen I can get with that. I can get a whole lot of hagen I can get a whole lot of holy, you know. It's hot outside. Hang in there. Hagios. And hagios means, wait for it. It's going to mess with you. It means different. God is different then. We're to be different. I didn't say better. Some Christians hear, oh, holy means to be, no, no, not better, different. Other, set apart. You could say, uh, just not fitting in, different, out of place, if you will. So if God is calling us to be different, God is calling us to be other, God is calling us to be out of place. When we realize that God wants us to be different, then we can begin to live intentionally out of place or intentionally holy. But one of the biggest obstacles for Christians living out of place is the desire to fit in. We have to overcome the desire to fit in. And so I'm glad that we talked about last week that when we realize, when we realize where we belong, and who we belong to, then we can begin to live intentionally or confidently or graciously out of place because we know where we belong. We understand that, that this world is not our home, that we're pilgrims, we're just visitors, we're just passing through. And so there are standards that God expects for us to have even if the world doesn't have them. It's okay, we're just visiting. You ever visit someone's house? You know, our kids, they have value. We instill values in them. We have expectations. We raise them with a biblical worldview. We pray before we eat. And sometimes when our kids go and visit their friends, some of them have the values we have. Sometimes they may not practice everything we do. If our kids go and visit and have a play date and they're sitting around the dinner table and they don't bow their heads and pray and bless their food and thank God, my kids will probably just silently pray and thank God. They probably won't get up and storm out the door because they're not, no. They know it's not their home. They're just visiting. They'll be coming home. My two older kids that are entering college, you know, my wife and I, we're praying for them. They're getting ready to go to a place where I know they're going to experience uh, values, morals that are different than ours. And we're praying for them. But we hope that they understand that that dorm is not their home. It's just a place where they're staying while they're visiting that university to get that degree. And when they come home, We hope that they'll still have those values that we have poured into them. We're just visiting. We're foreigners. This is not our home. 
And Peter has something to say about this in that ancient letter that he wrote to the Christians a couple of thousand years ago. And last week you looked at how in verses 1 through 12 that Peter talked about the privileges of belonging to the family of God. Let's just do a, a quick review of what Peter was saying to the church at that time. And remember, when he's writing to the church, they're being persecuted. I mean persecuted for their faith. And Peter says this to him in verse 1 and 2. He's in essence just saying that you are, you're one of your privileges of being part of God's, you have been elected and you have been hand-selected by God. If you've never been hand-selected by anybody, guess what? You know today that you've been hand-selected by God. In verse 3, he reminds us that we have a living hope. There's hope. Verse 4 and 5, he lets us know that that hope is indestructible, that we have an inheritance that we'll see when we get to heaven. In verses 6 through 9, he lets us know that we'll experience hardships, but they're just temporary. They don't last always. Isn't that good news? That it doesn't last always. I don't know about you, but when I see that part of Scripture, it just makes me feel good because if I'm dealing with something that's heavy, it's not going to last always. And then I love verse 10 and 12. We understand from Peter's writing that, that we have something so special. It's what the prophets predicted, Peter said. It's what the preachers proclaimed. It's what the angels scratched their heads and pondered about looking into. We have this great salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, that's a good place to clap. Woo. It's part of the privileges and benefits of being part of God's family. It feels good. But in verse 13, where we're going to pick up today, it's like Peter shifts the conversation. You know, he was talking about the privileges that we have of belonging to God's family, but he's shifting here. He's changing the attention to not just only the privileges, but now to the responsibilities of being part of God's family. So it's not just privileges, but there are some responsibilities. Let's read together. We're going to read 1 Peter. Beginning at verse 13 through 19, we're going to read seven verses. And we're going to see what Peter wants us to do. It says, therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is this therefore? This passage, therefore, that's coming next is now that you know the privileges you have, this is what you should do. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, when you didn't know any better. But just as he who called you to be holy, so be holy in all you do. Notice he didn't say in some of you what you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I would like to spend the remainder of our time here today looking at what Peter says and see how it will help us to live intentionally out of place in this dark world. In other words, how to live intentionally holy in this world. Now, there's four things that I'm going to talk about, and I'll, I'll go through them each step individually in a moment, but the four things that I'm going to talk about, if we're going to live intentionally out of place, is one, you have to prepare your mind. Two, you have to begin to shape your actions or conduct. Three, you have to focus your will. And four, you have to remember the cost. Now, if you didn't get all that written down, it's good, it's okay, because we're getting ready to look at each step closely. I know how some of us are. We'll start trying to fill in and think we missed it. We didn't miss it. We're going to slow it down, and we're going to look at each step. Number one, if we're going to live out of place intentionally, we need to prepare our mind. 1 Peter verse 13 says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope 
on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now, the first thing he's saying to prepare your minds, he says, to be alert. Now, I want to look at a, a more ancient translation. I want to look at the King James because the King James will give us a better insight into what Peter meant when he wrote this 2,000 years ago, and I think it'll help us today. The King James says, instead of be alert, King James says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, that's weird language. I, if I'm you, I'm thinking, gird up my what? I don't want anything to do with any loins, right? <laughs> that sounds kind of creepy. <laughs> but that was a saying in the old days. The, the men in that day, they wore long robes, kind of like a dress, gowns, right? They looked nice, but they weren't practical and functional. And so if a man was going to work, or if he was going to uh, run, or he, there was going to be a war and he had to fight, they had to pick their gown up from the bottom and tuck it inside of their belt and tighten their belt. That's girding up their loins. Now if they need to run, they can run without falling flat on their face. And now if they need to work, they can work without getting tripped up in their gown. Now if they need to fight, they can fight. They are ready. If we're going to live holy, our minds have to be ready. You know, I can relate to this because a couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to give some awards out to some high school graduates and I had an opportunity to wear my doctoral regalia. I don't often get to wear it. So when I get to wear it, I kind of like it. You know, it looks nice and, you know, but the thing about it is it's not practical or functional. And everything was okay until we had to go up on stage and I had to look at the stairs. And I was thinking, oh boy, I got on this long gown. I just hope I don't do a face plant going up the stairs. So I had to walk really careful. I didn't take my robe and gird up my loins. <laughs> So you got to be ready. You got to be alert. And he says this. The modern way of thinking about that is roll up the sleeves of your mind, right? So if we're going to have our minds prepared, there's two things we need to do. One is we need to think soberly or clearly. And some of you are like, I'm sober. <laughs> we're talking about more than just not being drunk, right? He's talking about thinking clearly. Not having your thoughts intoxicated by the way this world thinks. Not having your thoughts intoxicated by the evil one of this world. You gotta think clearly or soberly. He reminds us of this because we understand what behavioral science understands. They could have just looked in the Bible. That our actions generate from our thoughts. Proverbs 23 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if we want to behave holy, live holy, it starts in how we think. And so that we have to think clearly without the intoxication of the world. So that means that you have to think about what you're thinking about. You have to have metacognition to be conscious of the thoughts that you're thinking. Because every thought that you think is not yours. The evil one of this world, he'll whisper thoughts to you. Some thoughts you have to deal with that are thoughts from someone who said bad things to you at some time, at some point. Sometimes thoughts, they surface up, and you have to guard your thoughts so that you don't act out in a way that's not holy. So you got to think soberly. The second thing you have to do if you're preparing your mind is that you have to think hopefully. In verse 13, Peter says this. He says, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. To think hopefully means that you have to focus your mind on what's coming, not focus your mind on what's in front of you. Everybody sets their mind on something, right? And what you wanna make sure you do is you're setting on what's coming. If you're a student, right, they set their hope on graduation. They don't focus on what's in front of them, all the homework, all the reading, right, and all the tests. No, that would just weary them. They think about that graduation day. Or a, a bride or a groom, they set their hope on that wedding day, right? They don't focus in on all the details, and the, well, at least the men don't, the grooms don't, but you know what I'm saying, right? All the minutia, right, that is in front of them. No, you focus on the wedding day. And I'm going to be honest, I, I, I focus on the wedding day, but I also focus on that reception being over quickly because God is good. Hello, somebody. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
And athletes, some people still laughing. <laughs> but athletes, right, they, they, they can't focus on what's in front of them, the practices and um, uh, going to the gym and, and working out and all those things. No, you know what they have to do? They have to focus on that championship, right? So when you're like Kevin Durant and Steph Curry and the year doesn't seem like it's going so well, you just got to focus on that championship. Where are my Warrior fans at? Uh-oh, I must be in the wrong house. Cleveland Cavalier fans. <laughs> no, but you got to focus. And so as Christians, right, Peter is saying to the Christians, don't focus in on the day-to-day. -day. Don't focus in on the hardships and the sufferings that you're dealing with today. He says, no, I want you to focus on what's coming, the second coming of Jesus. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Woo. Because if you focus in on the sufferings and the hardships that are temporary, you'll make a decision in the moment that has eternal consequences. Don't get weary in well-doing, because in due season, you're going to reap a harvest. Being a Christian is not a sprint. Living holy is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So you got to keep on your eyes on Jesus. He's at the finish line, and you can't wait to see him because guess what he's going to say to you? Well done, my son, my daughter. Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. The second thing that we have to do, if we're going to live intentionally out of place, is shape our conduct. Now we're moving from thought to action. Peter is so skillful in this letter. He's moving from thought to action. He says here in verse 14 and 15, he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. So there's two parts here. There's two parts here if we're going to shape our conduct to live holy. There are things that we say yes to, and there are things that we say no to. There are things that we don't do, and there are things that we do. And first Peter, he deals with the things that we need to say no to. We need to say no to our past. You know, and this is so important because as Christians, uh, we're often guilty, and I have been in times past, of romanticizing what I call the B.C. days. And B.C. stands for before Christ. For me, it also stands before Christine, my wife, because, hey, either way, I was a moron, okay? I, I did things that I shouldn't be doing. But thank God for Christ and that Christ will give me Christine. Man, that's kind of cool. But they, they, they sometimes tell the stories of the B.C. days like the good old days. Oh, I just remember the good old days, man. We were partying and, and hanging out and, you know, the good old days. I, I had a couple of girls that I talked to at the same time, you know. The good old days, you know. It's like, you know, you need that one person, you know. The good old days, I had all the friends, yeah, okay, but you need that honest person to say, yeah, those friends that gossiped about you, and those, those good friends that left you when you didn't have anything. Oh, the good old days, when you mean when you were laying in the bathroom drunk and, and I had to pull you off the toilet and, oh, when I had to pick you up from, you know, the holding cell or, oh, the good old days when the, the ladies, huh, when you got caught over the one house by the one girl and you slept out the window and you had to call me to pick you up because they, you know, the good old days, right? Sometimes you need that friend to give you perspective when you have that selective amnesia. And so the Apostle Paul also does this for us, not Peter, but Paul also, he's that honest person in our life, just in case we start to romanticize the old evil days. Well, we didn't know any better. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful natures. By our very nature, we, subject, we were subject to God's anger, just like you were, just like everyone else. So Paul is basically saying this, in your B.C. days, you were dead, you were doomed, you were a prisoner to your own lust, and guess what? All of us, no one excluded, was the target of God's anger and wrath. That doesn't sound too cool. And he gives us that fresh, sober perspective. 
that we need to say no to those things. No to the places we used to go, some of them we shouldn't go anymore. No to some of the people we used to hang out with, there's some that we don't need to hang out with anymore. No to some of the internet sites we used to visit, we don't need to visit anymore. No to some of the books we we don't need to anymore. Those are things we need to say no to. And no is a powerful spiritual word. Try it. The next time the enemy tries to bring a thought to your mind that is tempting you to do something from those BC days, just say no. There's power in it. But not only do we need to say no to stuff, Christians are good at that. Oh, I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm better than you type thing. No. But what do we say yes to? Peter says we need to say yes to the Father. It's not good enough to just say no to the old life, we got to say yes to our Father. And what I love about him saying say yes to our Father is that he makes this this connection in verse 14 that we're obedient children. In other words, we're part of God's family. In other words, he's saying we should reflect God's holiness. We should say yes to being like God, our Father, in all the areas of our life. Imagine your life as a house, and Jesus wants to come visit We're good at living our lives in compartmentalized way. I live holy in this area of my life, but I'm going to keep this area of my life over here. God, you got all of this. You got to be okay with me having this over here. But God wants every area of our life. And sometimes some of us give God porch privileges. You can be on the porch of my life. Some of us will let him in the house into the foyer. Some of us will let him into that front room, you know, the room that we have for company. But what about when company shows up unexpectedly and you're grabbing everything in that room where you throw everything? Can he come to that room? Or can he go in the kitchen where everyone has that junk drawer? Can he come in there? Because he wants to. He wants access to all the areas of your life. You know why? Because he wants to paint your whole house with love. Because that's what it means to be holy. To be holy is to love your neighbor as yourself. When you're loving your neighbor, when you're loving yourself, you're going to behave in a way that is holy. And that's all he wants, is for us to be holy. We're his children. We should reflect his holiness. It reminds me of the story of Alexander the Great. And there's a story of this soldier who was a deserter that was caught at the time of Alexander's reign. And that soldier who deserted was brought before Alexander the Great. And Alexander says, young man, soldier, what's your name? And he looks at the emperor and he says, Alexander. And Alexander the Great had to take some time to compose himself because he got real angry. And he looks at the young soldier and he says, you got to do one or two things. He said, either change your name or change your behavior because you got my name. We've got God's identity. We always tell our kids, hey, when you're out there, you don't just represent yourself. You represent the Sweeney's. And that's what Peter's saying. Hey, we're not just out there alone. We represent God. And then the third thing that we need to do if we're going to live intentionally out of place is that we have to focus our will. We have to let the thoughts and the actions become convictions in our life. Verse 15 and 17, it says this. It says, but just as he who called you is holy, because I am holy, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners, here in reverent fear. And then there's one word he says next in verse 18, and it is the word knowing. Knowing is heavier than thinking and doing. You got to move from thinking and doing to knowing. Knowing is a conviction. Any wishy-washy person can have a belief But things can happen and they change their belief. But when you have a conviction, it is a belief that anchors us. It is a belief that you're willing to stand for. It's a belief that you're willing to die for. It is a conviction. And Peter is saying that living holy must become a conviction. It must become the core of who we are. Not just something that we think about and something that we do. And how does that happen? It doesn't happen just by itself is based upon two things that we find here in the the scripture. Number one, deeply held convictions are based upon written scripture. Verse 16, written scriptures, verse 16 says, Peter writes, it is written, he is quoting Leviticus, it is written that you should be holy. In other words, Peter is saying this, 
You should be holy because God says so. Because he says so. And so the scripture gives us conviction. I'm going to do it because God said so. It's like when kids are arguing, because mom said so. Because dad said so. That's why they have that conviction. And so it's not until you wrestle with a verse, until you wrestle with a scripture, and on the other side of that wrestling match, you come out saying, you know what? I believe that scripture. And you have a conviction in your knower. And I'm going to stand on it because God says so. That's like the conviction that Billy Graham used to have in his crusades. The Bible says. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. The Bible says that for whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but everlasting life. The Bible says there was a conviction because he wrestled with that thing till he believed it. Jesus was like that when he was tempted of the devil in the wilderness for 40 days. When the Satan came to him, Jesus said, it is written. When Satan came to him a second time, Jesus says, it is written. When Satan comes to him a third time, he says, it is written. So we have to have the authority of Scripture gives us conviction. The second thing is this, that it's based upon the future judgment. In verse 17, Peter says this, since you call on a father who judges each person's work. So he said not only did he say it, but remember, he's going to judge what you're doing. He's going to judge how you're living. So you want to live out of place. You want to live holy because he's watching and he's going to judge. There's going to be a consequence. It's like the kid who says, because mama said, and you also know what mama's going to do if you do it. <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and that's what Peter is basically saying to the people. Because God said, and God is an impartial judge. So it doesn't matter how cute you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't even matter if you're the baby of the family. Everybody ever know how the baby of the family always seems to get the, you know. I was a middle child, so uh, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but you got to know that, and it's our conviction comes from that. And the fourth thing, if we're going to live intentionally out of place, is you have to remember the cost. Remember the cost. Verse 18 and 19 says this. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This past week, we learned about the cost when we celebrate the 4th of July. Freedom isn't free. It costs many men and women their lives for us to have freedom in this country, and it continues to. Just like that, our freedom from sin, our redemption, our ability to be a part of God's family, it isn't free. It costs the precious blood of Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. Mm. So it's not free, but it's available to everybody. And when we remember what it cost him, we ought to be proud, convicted, to live intentionally out of place, intentionally holy. So how do we live intentionally holy? Prepare your mind, shape your conduct, focus your will, remember, remember, remember the cost. I want to pray with you at all the campuses. Bow your heads, please. If you're here today and you're not a part of God's family, you haven't found your belong, I want to help you today with this prayer. The Bible says if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can do that right where you are. God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he died for my sins that I might be forgiven. And that quick, that simple, you're saved. You belong to the family. You're born into the family. And I pray for all the rest of you here today that this word would encourage you and inspire you to live intentionally out of place, intentionally holy in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Cedar Creek.